Good Tuesday evening, everyone. It's great to be with you once again. Uh, I again will say uh, I'm so thankful for the wonders of technology that indeed allow us to connect in this way via Zoom. I want to encourage you in a couple of ways tonight to make the most of our time together. Uh, number one, I want to remind us all uh, to mute uh, our devices. So, um, Lord willing, you can hear me and we can uh, be most effectively encouraged by the truth of God's word. Secondly, and most importantly, I would say this. I would encourage all of us to make sure um, that we keep our finger on the page of God's word. That really is a, a, an important part of our message tonight. Uh, but especially I find when we are Zooming together, the tendency is to not make sure, to not be sure to have uh, our Bibles open, or our devices before us where we can see what God's word has to say. Just last week, um, on Thursday, actually, of last week, uh, my children finished school. Um, my daughter uh, finished the eighth grade. She's 14. And my son finished the sixth grade. He's 12 years of age. And we send our children to a, a private Christian school, a school called Tri-State Christian School. And one of the things I love about the school is that in the very mission of the school is this phrase. It's a phrase that Emmaus Bible College embraces as well. And I would suggest to you, it's a phrase that we all need to embrace, regardless of our place of education, uh, regardless of our professions or vocation. There's a phrase that I want to bring to our attention tonight, and that is the phrase, a biblical world view a biblical world view. In the mission of the school where my kids attend, they, uh, the school purpose is to teach, to teach children from a biblical world view where they can have excellence in learning and the development of lifelong uh, character. So excellence in lear learning, character development, but the important phrase that I wanna bring to our attention tonight is the phrase of biblical world view. It is the 1st of June, my friends. Can you believe that? June 1st today, and I have been reminded more the last six months than ever before the need for us to be courageous, the need for us as believers in Christ to stand upon his word especially in light of all that we're being bombarded with in our culture, society, and world. A biblical worldview, the need to respond to the circumstances all around us in light of what God's word has to say. And there are several things that have been in the news and have been uh, very, uh, very much before us. Uh, the last several weeks. One, we celebrated yesterday, Memorial Day. And I, I always think of Memorial Day, I always think of this phrase. It actually was a motto uh, from one of the, the special divisions of the Coast Guard, a group that are known as the Guardians. They had as their motto or phrase, and I know there's other branches in the military that have the same motto, but the phrase is, so that others may live, or even shortened, that others may live. And so I trust over the weekend, even as we hear all sorts of things in our culture and society, that we paused to think about those who gave their lives, that others may live. And that obviously makes us think of the Lord Jesus Christ in that he gave his life so that, that we may live. And so even with a holiday weekend and Memorial Day Monday, our world is suggesting we look at this particular time of year and this holiday through a, a different lens than perhaps even the word of God would challenge us uh, to think. I wanna encourage you to ask and answer this question tonight. 
we just have a few minutes together. And so I would love for you to, to think about this question uh, that is ever apparent and relevant for us today. How do we respond biblically? What is our biblical worldview in regards to what is happening in the Middle East? In regards to what is happening specifically uh, to God's chosen people, Israel, what is our what is our biblical response to that? What is our biblical worldview in regards to the conflict that uh, has been ever apparent in the Middle East over these last several weeks? There's something very unique about uh, Bethany Chapel and very unique about Arbor Oaks Bible Chapel where I attend and other assemblies uh, across the country and world. We are, we are in the minority in regards to some things that we hold near and dear in light of our biblical world view, in light of our biblical worldview. I just grabbed off, off the bookshelf behind me a book entitled, and I'd highly recommend everyone get a copy of this at some point in time and read it. Uh, it's a book entitled Dispensationalism Today. Dispensationalism Today by Dr. Charles Ryrie. Dispensationalism Today by Dr. Child, Charles Ryrie. And in his book, uh, this book entitled Dispensationalism Today, he makes a statement. And, and I don't say this to confuse or to use uh, technical language, but allow me to to make the statement and explain to you why it is so significant. What makes your local church unique and mine and, and most of the assemblies uh, across the states in the world, uh, and we are in the minority in regards to this, but he makes a statement and he says about dispensationalism, uh, he says that the, the sine qua non or the main thing the main thing about dispensationalism or the main uh, point of dispensationalism is threefold. Number one, that we approach scripture in a literal, normal, plain method of interpretation, that we would have a literal and plain hermeneutic. That when we study God's word, we would interpret it uh, literally and, and historically and, and take it uh, at its word. And I don't want to get into the weeds about hermeneutics, although it's a crucial subject matter for us to consider. But one of the first distinctions about dispensationalism, Dr. Ryrie would say, is how we take this book, God's word, and how we interpret it the method by which we interpret uh, the word of God, the science and art of biblical interpretation. Having a literal hermeneutic is number one, uh, the number one distinction of dispensationalism. Secondly, and as a result of that literal method of inter interpreting God's word, there is consistently maintained a distinction between Israel and the church. A distinction between Israel and the church. The most popular view in regards to Israel and the church is a, a teaching known as replacement theology. Uh, we would not embrace replacement theology, but it is uh, a far more popular perspective in regards to Israel and the church and the simple summary of that thinking is that the church has replaced Israel and Dr. Ryrie would suggest and we would hold and embrace that still today and until the Lord Jesus Christ returns he has a unique plan for his chosen people Israel God does and there's a distinction that we need to maintain in regards uh, to Israel in the church. So the sine qua non of dispensationalism, the main thing is number one, a literal hermeneutic. Uh, 
that we interpret scripture, scripture literally. Secondly, that we maintain a distinction between Israel and the church. And a third aspect is that all of God's workings throughout these dispensations, these distinguishable economies and the outworkings of God's purposes, all of them are for his glory. And that's the third aspect of the main teachings of dispensationalism. A literal interpretation, number one, a distinction between Israel and the church and all of God's workings throughout the dispensations, including the dispensation we find ourselves in, are for his glory. Now, I want to ask you a question. And if you have a piece of paper or uh, a, a pen, or you could jot this down even on your notes uh, on your phone, I want to ask you, where would you turn in God's word? Where would you turn in God's word to support? that he still has a plan for Israel and that regardless of what circumstances we find ourselves facing and more specifically what Israel finds themselves facing what does God's word have to say about these things where would you go in God's word where would you turn to respond to the conflict we've seen the last month in, in the Middle East, where would you turn? Mr. Sullivan, Rob, and myself, we have the privilege of, of serving with an organization called the Friends of Israel. And often we hear in, in their mission documents, they will turn to Genesis chapter 12. So I'd love to just look at that with you for just a few moments. Genesis chapter 12. This is where we find in chapter 15 as well of Genesis, we find the, the Abrahamic covenant, a covenant that God makes with Abraham, and we're not going to talk about the, the specifics of what's in the covenant, but notice what it says about God's chosen people, Israel, and the equation here is not complicated. Verses 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. There's a land promise. And I will make you a great nation. There's a nation promise. And I will bless you and make your name great. There's a name promise. And you shall be a blessing. Promise of blessing. And you shall be a blessing. And listen to verse 3. And I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you, I will curse. It's a simple statement, but a statement that holds true for today. When we interpret scripture literally, and when we maintain a distinction between Israel and the church, and we remember that all of God's orchestrative workings throughout these time periods are for his glory, we know that this is still true. And so we are thrilled to serve with friends of Israel because we are making an effort to bless God's chosen people, Israel, through that ministry and share the gospel with his chosen people and knowing that when we do so, blessing will result. But this, the same is true regarding those who curse Israel, that cursing will result. So I wanted to begin, and maybe this is one passage you jotted down uh, as you were thinking about, what do we know that God's word says as we uh, are forced this year, we're six months into the year, and we've had to think about our biblical worldview more than ever and courageously say, here's what God's word says regarding this, regarding marriage, regarding gender, regarding sexuality, regarding, and the list goes on and on and on. Here's what God's word says, and we need to be willing to say that as well about Israel, about Israel. One of our friends who, who uh, attends a, an assembly in Philadelphia, 
uh, a Jewish man who knows and loves the Lord. His name is Steve Herzig. I think, I think many of you might know Steve. He serves full-time with Friends of Israel. He, for years, lived in the Chicagoland area. And early in his uh, ministry, after he came to know the Lord, he put a, a, an ad in the paper. He couldn't do this today. But he put an ad in the paper that was uh, provocative in language that caused people to think, will, and if so, how will the nation of Israel be destroyed? I don't remember. I actually reached out to them today. What was the exact language of the article you put in the paper to attract people to a Bible study about Israel? Will the nation of Israel survive? Come study the word of God with us and find out. And he often would turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And I invite you to turn there with me. We've seen the simplest of statements all, and, and a significant one regarding the covenant that still stands with, uh, with Israel. If we bless God's chosen people, Israel, we will be blessed. And those who curse them will be cursed. This is what God's word says. And we need to make sure our worldview is based upon his word. In Jeremiah chapter 31, I find these verses incredible. And the language that is used here is language of exaggeration uh, to establish the fact that these things never can happen. And as a result, as a result, Israel will never be destroyed. Listen to these verses, Jeremiah chapter 31, and we'll pick up at verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If, verse 36, if the fixed order departs before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring, offspring of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, verse 37, if the heavens above can be measured, and the answer is they cannot, if the heavens ab above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Two statements in this section, statements, uh, at least two statements about creation and, and God's uh God's thread uh, that is woven throughout creation and how it all is, is held together. And, and Jeremiah makes this, uh, or the Lord makes the statement, if these things ever can happen, or I'll state it more clearly, these things must happen in order for the nation of Israel to be no more. And the point of this passage is these things will never happen. And so God's plan for Israel, his plan for Israel will, will be and will be, will continue and will be maintained. And so when we're, we're dealing with conflict and, and heartache and loss of life and, and terrorism and all sorts of things in the Middle East, we can be reminded from God's word what he says about his chosen people, Israel. Um, some of you met my dad along the way through Mass Bible College and uh, other, other interactions, I think, as well. And, and you might not know this about my dad, but my dad loved to sing. He enjoyed singing. And he actually was, uh, had voice lessons when he was young and, and had a great voice. I loved listening to him sing. And uh, I don't read music naturally but when I could sit by when I sat by my dad I was able to 
follow his lead and sing harmony and uh, the bass part and so forth. He loved to sing. And in the midst of the conflict, uh, especially when, when uh, it was quite heated uh, weeks ago, um, Friends of I Israel put out an article and made reference to, to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. And I read the article and for days, I kept thinking about my dad singing these words. He who watches over Israel. Does anybody know how it goes? Have you ever sung it in days gone by? He who watches over Israel slumbers not. I see you, Miss Louise. Slumbers not, nor sleeps. I love that. This is a, a one of the Psalms of Ascent, and I want to just read it to you. Uh, Psalm 121. But think about it in regards to what it's saying about Israel. And we often miss this when we are studying God's word that much of the Old Testament is addressing Israel specifically. Jeremiah 29, 11, we talk about that often, really dealing specifically with Israel. But listen to these words. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains for where shall my, from where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Verse three, he will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night the lord will protect you from all evil he will keep your soul the lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever this is a psalm that the children of israel would sing a psalm of ascent when they would go to jerusalem for the the feasts that they would observe annually and beyond. And they would sing these Psalms of Ascent and they would anticipate what is the millennium. Uh, and that's part of a literal interpretation of God's word and a distinction between Israel and the church, the reality of the millennial kingdom where we will reign with Christ and Israel on this earth. More could be said. You know what Psalm 122 says in regards to Israel, what we are supposed to do as we consider our biblical worldview? It tells us that we need to pray for Israel. Pray for Israel. Read that next one on your own. Psalm 122 and an encouragement to, to pray for Israel. And so tonight I wanted to remind us in just a few verses remain I wanted to remind us that as we think about the circumstances all around us, I'm picking one specifically, the conflict uh, in the Middle East uh, and how that impacts God's chosen people, Israel. And I wanted to challenge us to not get caught up in all the hype and not get caught up in all the different perspectives on this subject matter. And I dare say a subject matter that has been in place for a long time, anti-Semitism. I want us to remember that we need to keep our finger on the page. I want to give you a little quiz as we are about to close. I want to ask you to try to remember the words that go along with these people. We, uh, we talked about the walkthrough on two different occasions. I've said it would be great sometime for Mr. Sullivan to demonstrate the walkthrough for you. He doesn't have to do the motions, but maybe the words. We talked about, do you remember, we talked about Saul and the words that corresponded, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. 40, 40, 40, 120 years. We talked about in detail, Joshua chapter 14, Caleb and all heart or whole heart. And then as you, be, you have begun in, uh, the study in the book of Ezra, uh, 
uh, we, we identified several people in that time period where there were the returns from Babylonian captivity. And we looked at a person named Zerubbabel. What, what should come to mind? What one word when we think of Zerubbabel? Temple, that's right. Zerubbabel temple. And then right after Zerubbabel, in between chapter six and 20, chapter six and chapter seven of Ezra, you'll be reminded is, uh, is a queen. What was her name? When we think of Esther, we think of the word queen. After Esther, of course, was Ezra people, Nehemiah walls. And you'll be studying these things. But you know what you'll find when you get into the book of Esther? It's one of the greatest passages that teaches that we should not be anti-Semitic. That we should maintain a distinction between Israel and the church. And I want to just highlight two or three things quickly. If you'll turn to Esther with me just for a moment or two, Esther chapter six. This is, uh, this is an important chapter. Uh, chapter six, verse one is really the pinnacle of the chapter where these uh, ironic reversals take place because providentially the king could not sleep. And so things are reversed for, for Haman, uh, negatively and positively for Mordecai. The end of chapter six, we find something very amazing. Haman knew the reality of, of Mordecai being a Jewish uh, person. Often in the text, it says Mordecai the Jew. But some would suggest his wife and family were just learning of this. And this is what it says in verses uh, 13 and, and 14 of chapter 6. And Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, Listen to this. This is amazing. These people didn't know the Lord. But these people said, if Mordecai is Jewish, Haman, you're done. They, they, individuals who were lost, pagan, they knew God's promise to his chosen people, Israel. If Mordecai, before, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him but will surely fall before him. True statement, and they knew it. God has a promise for his chosen people, Israel, who have not been replaced by the church. As we read on, Esther, who found favor and was pleasing in the sight of the king, makes a, a declaration and asks that her people be spared that the the edict that was already pronounced against them that a new reversal ironically a new edict would be a uh, decree would be put in place and that's exactly what occurred look at chapter uh, 8 verse 3 then esther spoke again to the king fell at his feet wept and implored him to avert the evil scheme of haman and his plot, which he had devised against the Jews. What is that plot? What was that plot? To destroy them. Can you look, and maybe this would be a great study sometime, at the attempts to destroy God's chosen people, Israel. We have some that happened not terribly long ago. And we have it all around us, even today. And here God's word shows us time and time again that Israel will not be destroyed then esther spoke again to the king fell at his feet wept and implored him to avert the evil scheme of haman and his plot which he had devised against the jews and the king extended the golden scepter to esther so esther arose and stood before the king and the rest of the story you'll soon get to but israel is not destroyed and 
Israel continues, and there's a celebration, the Feast of, uh, of Purim, a celebration that the end of Esther describes that continues for God's chosen people, Israel, where they celebrate once again deliverance because of God's promise and plan for Israel. He will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse him. So in the midst of the madness, dear friends, may we be certain to keep our finger on the page and have a biblical world view. Society, media, the news, they're all so deceptive with various uh, agendas and perspectives. May our perspective always be based upon what God's word says. A literal interpretation, a distinction between Israel and the church, all of these interworkings providentially throughout these time periods and economies for God's glory. Father, I ask that you would just help us, help us as a people to respond to all that is around us that is a subject matter of such debate and such controversy, may we be gentle and may we be appropriate, but may we be courageous and bold to stand, uh, to stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And so may we be reminded of what your word says about your chosen people, Israel. May we realize that blessing comes when blessing is given and cursing results when cursing takes place. May we remember that you're a God of plan and order. And may we maintain a distinction between Israel and the church. May we interpret your word plainly, literally, we would ask and pray. And may we see your, your sovereign working providentially all for your glory ultimately. And we praise you that we get to be a part of that. Help us with these things, we pray, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.